Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Jean Mayer USDA Human Nutrition Research Center on Aging Monday Seminar Series. I'm Dr. Roger Fielding, and I'm the Associate Director of the HNRCA. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Tom Wang. Dr. Wang is the research leader in the Diet, Genomics, and Immunology Laboratory at the Beltsville Human Nutrition Research Center. Dr. Wang received his PhD in nutritional biochemistry at the University of California, Davis, and then did further postdoctoral training at Purdue University. The title of his presentation today will be Mechanistic Studies on Health Promoting Effects of cruciferous vegetables and rice, connecting agriculture and nutrition research. So welcome Dr. Wang, and I'll turn the uh, agenda over to you for your seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and, and thank you uh, Dr. Fielding for uh, <clears throat> invitation to uh, speak at uh, HNRC. I'm gonna Do you see my slides? Yes, we're able to see them. If you could put them Thank in you. mode. Okay, so uh, my name is Tom Lank, and uh, I always introduce myself as farmers from uh, Bellsville. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, today's talk, uh, actually, it's a little bit uh, uh, kind of uh, take me away from my comfort zone because I'm a uh, more of a cell and molecular biologist, but I think it's an important issue. So uh, I'm hoping that I can connect the ag agriculture and nutrition research together, and and then uh, hopefully articulate its important the connection is it's important. <clears throat> so um, um, as a, a member of uh, a person that work in an agriculture institute and also do nutrition research. Uh, we have two aspects that uh, we deal with. The, uh, we have the agriculture aspect, which uh, including increasing, increasing yield, uh, you know, make the food taste better, shelf life, nutrient level, safety, and also new food. And from the nutrition side, we're interested in knowing uh, what's good for you, when it's good for you, where it's good for you, why, how it's good for you, how much it's good for you, and who's good for you. And given that we're also doing uh, gut microbiome research, so I'm going to frame the uh, our the work is from farm to poop. It's some kind of jazzy word uh, for it. Now, <clears throat> all these works eventually going to uh, end up uh, uh, to promote health. I think that's our ultimate goal. Uh, so. In, in our route to Nirvana, which uh, now is called uh, precision uh, nutrition, there's actually multiple component or puzzles that uh, need to fit together. Um, obviously, you know, we, the experimental biologists and use model cell animal and do me me mechanistic work. The agriculture side, you have the uh, production, you have the post-harvest, uh, 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 modification, uh, production practice, and also uh, human uh, studies, including uh, control of diet, uh, human study or population study, clinical study, and last but not the least, and some of the social aspect, including uh, you know how the consumer uh, preferences like the economic of the uh, uh, food and agricultural system. Uh, everything needs to fit together. Um, and then my thinking is that, you know, the so-called secret so sauce to put everything together is technology, uh, including that, you know, the uh, more advanced instrument, you can sequence everything, uh, like, you know, within seven days, and you have the uh, new software to put, to, to analyze things. And also, uh, more recently, uh, the uh, emergence of AI technology, which uh, help us uh, curate and uh, integrate and analyze data. So all these things to, be, to, to kind of fit together uh, so we can reach our nirvana. 
Um, obviously, diet is important, and you can you know search the literature. Is there's always something associated with diet, either the etiology, progression, or prevention. And these are just the top ten uh, 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 cause of death for America in 2019. And everyone with the uh, asterisk is a, there's a link to uh, diet. So it's relatively important uh, for. Um, for us to study diet and uh, uh, and how, how to use diet to prevent all these diseases. Uh, this is the uh, more of a public service announcement from uh, American Institute of Cancer Research that uh, they say <clears throat> if you you know modify your your have a healthy uh, healthy pattern, uh, including staying lean, eating smart. And you can you can basically prevent uh, one third of the common cancer and and from a healthcare uh, perspective you know people's health will be improved and also from a healthcare cost perspective uh, it will it will uh, minimize all these costs of healthcare so uh, it's relatively important uh, for us to try to try to find way to uh, uh, prevent diseases and diet obviously will be an important. Uh, the important factor. Now, the, the problem is that we're, we're this is a E. coli um, metabolic pathway. And we, as a, a multicellular, multi organ organism, uh, it's much more complicated. And most of the time, you know, uh, the reduction I tend to work on a little tiny area. And also, our food is uh, relatively complex because they have multiple components and things like that. So if we're talking about nutrition and disease prevention, uh, it's relatively complicated. And of course, the whole world become much more complicated in about past 10 years or so because you know, all of a sudden we found another universe it's called gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome that's, you know, it, it's the all it can be say that it's a whole universe by itself, but then it it can modulate information. You can produce small molecule and affect uh, uh, the host's uh, physiology, and then you can change energy balance uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's become uh, a little bit complicated when you deal with diet uh, because uh, this is just an example um, of how complicated. Uh, it can be is that uh, diet may have a uh, influence on uh, the gut microbiome. This is just looking at uh, uh, from a child from uh, Africa and versus a child from U Europe. Obviously, their diet will be different. The African uh, child will have a more agriculture diet, and the European uh, child will have a westernized diet. And you can see over here. Uh, the microbiome are completely different. So diet play a role in, in, in modulating the microbiome, therefore may have an impact on health. Now, here comes the even more of a problem. Uh, this is uh, 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 Wilbur Atwater. Uh, we call it uh, our grandpappy. I think the folks from BHNRC can trace d d direct lineage to uh, uh, Dr. Atwater. The Atwater is known to be the uh, uh, Atwater uh, factor where you have the calorie 449 uh, uh, kcal for uh, uh, protein, carbohydrate, and, and fat. And look what he said uh, when uh, during the uh, 1800s that, you know, after completing his study, Atwater concluded that American consumed too much fat and sweets and did not exercise enough. And this is in 1800s. So if we fast forward to the so-called internet era. This is a dietary guideline for Americans. This is 2010. Uh, if you look at the, the middle bar over here, this is the goal or the limit. And here you have the uh, sugar and fat. It, we have way over too much sugar and fat. And some of the so-called goodies, uh, you know, like the whole grain, vegetable, were uh, relatively under uh, con uh, con uh, consumed uh, to the recommended dietary allowance. So, if we fast forward another ten years, this is uh, uh, 2015, 2020. 
if you look at it again, you know, the middle line will be the conserved recommendation. And you can see over here, you know, fat, sugar, sodium, they're all much higher uh, uh, than what's recommended. And then we're also under consumed vegetable and fat. So basically the message seemed to be American doesn't give a hoot about their diet, which become a problem because if we're gonna say, well, you know, eat this is good for you, uh, it's American basically ignored. So uh, obviously people are, are, are uh, trying to work on it, you know, food, uh, things like food availability, education, like, you know, five a day, by play, those kind of things. Uh, we'll, we'll try to do that to, in, from uh, education, try to educate the public. But there's also another way to do it. It's from the agriculture point of view. So we can develop a, a, a tastier, more attractive food, people will eat it, or you know, even, you know, enhance the nutrient uh, content of a food or develop new food uh, that can uh, uh, kind of you know compensate for a nutrient deficiency or whatever, uh, but that kind of opened up a nutrition problem. So how do we know the new food uh, good, uh, it, 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 it's better? So uh, uh, the notion of you know adding in, increasing a, a component in in the food, how do we know that more is better? Uh, and, and what are the biological effects? Because you know, some of the food we've been consuming for a thousand of years, but you know, if you come with something new, you know, we don't know what is good or bad. Uh, so that kind of, uh, it's for the last couple of years, that's, that's uh, our focus on uh, trying to you know, address those kind of questions. I think it's, it's relatively important. Uh, so why, why do we want to look at a kusuri's vegetable? Um, well, it, again, in our literature, uh, consumer, consumption of kusuri's vegetable is, is, is always associated with promotion, uh, promotion of health. Uh, you can, uh, like type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and a whole host of, of cancer. Uh, for my, my own personal area, which uh, cancer prevention, uh, we are also interested in, in uh, cancer, to, cancer protective agent and you know, from crucified vegetable, uh, indofluorocarbonyl and uh, thiocyanine, and also uh, sulforaphane, all known to be uh, have a, a purported cancer protective effect. So, crucified vegetable are good for you. Uh, this is looking at the food uh, vegetable availability or, or actually consumption data. You can see over here the American. This is American. Uh, eat a lot of potato. A tomato. So, in terms of uh, crucified vegetable, other vegetable is relatively low. So, from an economic perspective, we can, if we can encourage people to start eating more of this uh, uh, vegetable over here, we may help the uh, farmer to grow more and then they will benefit from it. Uh, but then, why, is, why rice? Um, Rice is a little bit kind of, you know, maybe one may consider that a little bit odd uh, because the uh, uh, American doesn't eat much of the rice over here. Uh, you can see American, but in the worldwide, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, actually number three staples in, uh, in the worldwide. But, but more important is, is here. Uh, we actually uh, export a lot of rice. Uh, we're number five in, 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 in the, uh, a world in, in exporting rice. So uh, there's an economic aspect uh, to uh, rice. Uh, the other thing is rice is, you know, rice is mostly starch. And uh, there's something called resistant starch uh, that in the literature. And resistant starch is starch that it, it, it escape from uh, di digestion and um, um, in, in the intestine, and it's available for uh, bacterial fermentation in the large intestine. Um, what's uh, uh, available, uh, and, and you can find uh, uh, resistant starch in, in a, a, a whole host of, of food, including banana, uh, rice, or uh, cereals, and things like that. And current thinking is that you can break it down to type one, type two, type three, and type four. 
I think some somebody is saying that it could be type five, type type six now. But uh, in the rice, since we eat rice mostly cooked, it actually will be the type three uh, uh, resistant starch. And there's there's in the literature, um, resistant starch are known to be um, uh, have uh, quite a few health. Uh, uh, promoting effect too, including prevention of diabetes, regulation of uh, uh, lipid metabolism, uh, improvement in insulin uh, re uh, resistance, decrease intestinal inflammation, reduction of colon cancer risk, and so on and so forth. And more recently, uh, microbiome, changes in microbiome as well, generation of short chain fatty acids uh, has been um, uh, proposed as a possible mechanism by which uh, resistant starch uh, provide all these wonderful protective effects. Um, so, but but I, this is just you know more like an intermission. I want to add a point in here. So you know, in terms of food, what is good for you? Uh, I, I I think we should also kind of keep in mind the classical nutrients. Uh, you know, me as you know, we do cancer prevention, we look at, you know, magic bullets, but then if you go back to the food level, uh, at least class, providing classical uh, nutrients may be more important. I mean, it's just a, uh, uh, my thinking. Uh, for example, you know, like collard green, uh, if you look at the, the, the beta carotene con uh, concentration, it's much better than tomato, which is known to be, you know, rich sources of beta carotene. Uh, and then they also have other uh, nice uh, classical nutrients. Um, and then you look at the kale, the same thing. These are the top two that, that would, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, so-called beneficial carotenoids or, or vitamin. So, I, I mean, I, I want to remind people that let's not forget about classical nutrient uh, and in, in terms of uh, looking at, you know, what is good for you. So um, we uh, initiated a study looking at red cabbage and red cabbage microgreen. Uh, red cabbage is a crucifix vegetable. Uh, using the obesity, uh, uh, re, uh, looking at obesity related risk factor you know, using a rodent model. Now, so what is microgreen? Uh, so microgreen are um, like a young seedling about that big, um, it's about seven to 14 day. We, we kind of harvest it around uh, 11 day or so. Um, it have uh, over here, you can see over here, there's two uh, fully developed leaves. Um, and it's not a sprout. A sprout is slightly different from, from it. It's regulated by uh, FDA. Um, you can find microgreen in uh, a, a lot of food actually, because you use it uh, sometimes as a decoration, you know, you put it in food, but if you taste it, um, actually um, they're very flavorful. So, you know, they, it's been, uh, you can put it in a salad, you know, add a little bit of spike into your, 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 your uh, food. So our objective is, is, is uh, to ask the following question, you know, uh, what kind of health promoting effect does red, uh, red cabbage microgreen has? And you know, it's similar to uh, mature red cabbage because these are relatively new food. And what are the molecular effects? Uh, we use the rodent mo model, C57 black. We have uh, do a two by three design that, uh, using a low uh, fat and a high fat, 45% fat. It's supplemented with the, either the red cabbage or red cabbage microgreen at around 200 gram per day per 60 kilogram individual. This is a, a eight weeks feeding study. Uh, before we go into the, the, the more uh, animal study, and this is just uh, additional information. This work was done by uh, my collaborator, uh, Sonny Law, uh, also at ARS. And this is, I think it's the first one that, that talking about uh, Michael Green, uh, well, having a much more uh, say nutrient dense, and this is comparing beta carotene, vitamin C, and vitamin E, and compared to the mature one, it seemed to have much higher level of all these uh, 
uh, the so-called uh, classical nutrients. Uh, for us, we're, uh, since my cancer prevention background, we're interested in uh, uh, so-called uh, glucosinolate. Uh, and you can see over here, the red cabbage microgreen have almost like twice as much of these uh, 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 glucosinolates, even though you know there's some more similar and some are uh, more different. So microgreen tend to be a slightly different from uh, the mature uh, red cabbage, and then uh, uh, its its uh, nutrient content may be higher. So this is the uh, our animal study. Um, basically, the the food is well taken because you know, uh, since these are cruciferous vegetable, you always worry, worry about the animal not eating it. But what we found was that uh, both the red cabbage and red cabbage microgreen, they attenuated the um, uh, weight increase, the rate of weight increase uh, by the high fat diet. So that's good. <clears throat> so we dig a little bit deeper and try to look at uh, liver cholesterol and try to classify a level. And they're a little bit different. Um, for example, you know, uh, red cabbage uh, seem to be affecting the total uh, uh, cholesterol level in, uh, in, in liver, but both uh, <clears throat> red cabbage microgreen and red cabbage, uh, they both attenuated this increase of uh, liver cholesterol ester. There's not much effect on the free cholesterol, but microgreen in particular seem to affect the triglyceride level in liver. If you look at the fecal bioacid and cholesterol, uh, there are really not much effect of, on the bioacid. What's interesting here is that the red cabbage seem to uh, lead to a, a lower uh, uh, fecal total cholesterol level compared to other group. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, uh, molecular effect, uh, so you, you always want to correlate that with the, uh, um, your observation. We didn't see much uh, uh, changes over here uh, with the uh, uh, markers, uh, cyclone P57A1, this is the uh, uh, bioacid synthesis, uh, limiting fat or limiting enzyme. So there, there's probably not as too much effect on the, uh, the removal of pathway. And while it seemed to affect the, uh, both the uh, fatty acids metabolism uh, by uh, the microgreen and, and red cabbage, but microgreen in particular seemed to affect uh, the a triglyceride synthesis pathway as well as cholesterol ester synthesis pathway. So uh, we also look at inflammatory marker because you know one of the hallmark of um, a high fat diet is causes liver inflammation. Uh, in this case, we uh, look at uh, um, C reactive protein and TNF alpha, and then it's you get both uh, the red cabbage microgreen as well as red cabbage, they all inhibited the production of these uh, so-called inflammatory markers, just think that there was some kind of protective effect against these, uh, uh, against inflammation. Um, we, uh, this is a little bit kind of complicated, so I'll just uh, describe it. We also look at the, uh, the gut microbiome, uh, as, as, as you see, you can see over here, this is the low fat, and this, this over here is high fat. They're, uh, they're very different. And then by adding uh, either microgreen or red cabbage in there, you move, uh, you, 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 you kind of change the uh, gut microbiome. And uh, uh, from the uh, graph, uh, you can really tell, but you know, the number says that they are very different from each other. Uh, the only thing that didn't do much was that um, uh, the red cabbage microgreen and a uh, uh, high fat, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, red cabbage and a high fat uh, uh, diet background didn't seem to do to uh, differentiate much from, uh, 
from the high fat diet. And this is looking at a, a so-called beta diversity of the uh, bacteria. Um, we also look at a so-called uh, uh, alpha diversity, which is the richness of the, the microbiome. Uh, uh, what we found is that the microgreen in particular um, it seemed to be a, uh, different from uh, the uh, uh, low fat or high fat con control. The red capture doesn't seem to be doing anything. These A, B, C, D are just a different way of calculating uh, uh, diversity and um, seems like the microgreen uh, consistently seem to have an effect from a, uh, from a uh, alpha diversity perspective. So um, in terms of micro, uh, red cabbage microgreen, um, what we can conclude is that you know, they're, they're both uh, red cabbage and, and, and red cabbage microgreen seem to be affecting the gut microbiome. For the, for the red cabbage microgreen, uh, it's affecting the cholesterol uh, ester, uh, affecting triglyceride. Um, and then there's enzymes such as SOAT1, such as DGAT1, that's affected uh, and maybe contribute to the uh, decrease in triglyceride and cholesterol ester. And I think the more important thing is that you do have a lower inflammatory effect because of these uh, uh, this, this lower in cholesterol or triglyceride uh, content in liver. So this is our um, so-called working model. Uh, now we move on to the, the, the rice. So what we are looking at is cooked rice uh, with different uh, resistance starch level. Uh, and also we're still using the diet-induced obesity model. So our objective is, is trying to uh, look at what, ask the question that would uh, resistance are introduced as a whole food have some of the fact as isolated, uh, res uh, isolated resistant starch. I mean, there's a lot of it, uh, 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 literature out there for resistance starch, but um, looking at it from a whole food perspective, it's much less. Uh, so what would be interesting to know, you know, if you introduce it to food, what the different level of resistance starch, what would happen? Um, and I want to know what are the mechanisms of resistance starch that promote health? And then uh, at, at, I think this is more, to me, is uh, relatively important, is what kind of concentration of resistance starch is required to elicit an effect on health parameters such as weight, lipid, metabolism, or, or church and fatty acid production. And this one, we're still using the C57 black, but uh, we use a slightly lower di uh, fat level at 39%. This is more like uh, what a uh, normal westernized diet at, uh, at the high uh, fat uh, level would be. And then th this is um, uh, replacing a starch using, uh, with, with cooked rice uh, at 410 gram per kilogram diet. Again, this is an eight week feeding uh, study. So rice, um, rice in, uh, with uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, uh, resistance content. Uh, this is working with the uh, Dale Bumper uh, uh, International Research Center with ARS, uh, ARS unit and also a Southern Research uh, Center Minchin from uh, the Dale Bumper and Steve Booth from uh, uh, SRC. Uh, there are different rice here. You have the Titan varietal, Presidio, and then this uh, Art Newton over here. And the important thing is that your the uh, resistance starch uh, dry weight level is like 0 0.1, 1, and then 8.6 uh, uh, percent. So they're they're very different from each other. And which we. We kind of use the Titan as more like a uh, more like a matrix uh, control. Um, uh, what we found was that um, the they're, they're not much different in in, in the total uh, body weight gain. They didn't do much uh, to the body weight. But what we found was that uh, with the different resistance starch, it seems to affect the adipose tissue, specifically uh, the sizes of adipose tissue, as well as the 
the size of the the, the uh, uh, cell seems to be slightly um, it seems to be attenuated uh, because you know it, this is high fat diet and then uh, it's lower than the high fat diet. And we follow up uh, looking at some of the biochemical uh, uh, parameter. For example, uh, leptin level and, and both uh, the so-called medium uh, uh, resistance charge and the high resistance charge seem to attenuate the um, uh, high fat diet to induce increase in leptin. Um, but if you're looking at the triglyceride content in the liver and triglyceride content in, in the fecal uh, sample, seems like only the high fat diet, oh, I'm sorry, the high resistance starch uh, supplement diet have an effect. Uh, and for the triglyceride and fecal sample, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the high, uh, high resistance starch seem to be, seem to um, in, increase the uh, um, triglyceride uh, content in fecal sample. Um, so we also look at uh, the molecular markers and try to see what exactly happening uh, in, in the adipose tissue. In the adipose tissue, uh, leptin seem to be affected, uh, uh, which is consistent with the circulating level. But um, the, the other gene that get affected is the, this is uh, uh, triglycerides, um, uh, lipases and seem to be affected by both the, the medium uh, uh, level resistance starch and high resistance starch. But all the other uh, enzyme that in the uh, uh, lipogenesis or lip, uh, lipo, uh, lipolysis pathway seem to only affected by high uh, uh, resistance starch. And a couple of marker, uh, inflammatory marker the SCP1 or the monocyte uh, chemoattractant protein, or also known as CCL2, uh, and also uh, uh, interleukin-6, seem to be affected only by the high resistant uh, starch uh, supplemented uh, group. Um, so we, we also look at the fecal short chain fatty acid uh, level uh, and the pH and try to, uh, and, and also uh, some uh, colonic um, uh, molecular marker. And what we found is that um, only the high resistance starch group, uh, we can see an uh, increase in acetate, propionate, or butyrate. And then only in, in, in the high resistance starch group, we see a dramatic drop in the uh, uh, pH level. Now, uh, if you look at, we also have a, a whole host of uh, a column marker that related to uh, inflammation, you know, uh, uh, adhesion barrier or transporter, but we didn't see any changes in that. So basically there's not much uh, 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 effect on the cone uh, itself. <coughs> and well, we also found that the uh, uh, different resistant starch can, can affect the gut microbiome. The, uh, uh, I should point out that the, the, uh, the fat, the low fat, the 10% and 39%, really not much different. I mean, we, uh, unlike the 45% of a fat seem to be very different from the 10%, and 39% is not much different. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for the resistance starch, you can see that uh, this is medium, this is high. Uh, they, they're, they're all very different from each other, so somehow the resistance starch is modifying the gut microbiome. The other thing we found was that if you, um, there's, a, there's a few uh, bacteria seem to correlate very well with the uh, uh, different uh, uh, short chain fatty acid level, suggesting that these bacteria may be <coughs> associated with production of these uh, short chain fatty acids. So 
a working model here is that you know um, rice. Uh, if you can you know, resistant, if you consume it as a whole food in rice, uh, if you have something like uh, uh, greater than um, uh, one percent, uh, you start seeing an effect at the adipose as adipose weight level. You also see an effect at the microbiome level. Uh, but some of the uh, the parameter that we look at, you know, including the gene expression changes, triglyceride, liver triglyceride. Uh, trigen fatty acid. Uh, it seems like you need to have a, a little bit higher uh, uh, resistance starch to see a uh, see an effect. And also, leptin was uh, uh, expression uh, was was decreased, and it could be uh, because of the you know changes in the adipose uh, uh, sizes that affect the leptin. So this is our current model. Now. Um, in the next section, I, uh, it's more of like some of, try to use some of our old data and then uh, uh, some, some of the things in the literature to make a uh, articulate point. It didn't re really quite fit into the data section, but I think it's important to, to, to uh, uh, kind of articulate these, these uh, points out. So, <clears throat> The, the, the one first thing is food matrix may affect bioavailability. Uh, this is the um, uh, older study that we've done uh, looking at something called uh, uh, glyceolin. This is a compound of phytoestrogen from a soy. And we also look at the circling level of this compound in the animal. And what we found is that um, there, there's a threefold difference in, in circulating level. Uh, it depends on what, whether you're eating a 10% fat or 30, uh, 36% fat. So the, the, the thinking is that, you know, if you, you these compounds are not gonna be by itself. I mean, we, again, you know, we're reductionists. We want to, see, you know, look at magic bullets and things like that. But in a diet environment, it will be worth a bunch of other stuff. And then this is as simple as, you know, different amount of fat, the, the uptake will be different. Uh, therefore, you think that, you know, maybe the efficacy will be different, uh, depend on different food matrices. <clears throat> um, this it's an older study that with my former colleague, Bev Clevedens. Uh, these are, Bev had done a, a, a controlled diet human study um, looking at uh, uh, people drinking watermelon juice or tomato juice. I think these are watermelon juice data and looking at the response of uh, beta carotene in circulation. Uh, these are just measuring uh, for taking the four weeks uh, plasma uh, beta, uh, beta carotene level. And what we've done is we did a cluster, cluster analysis and we were able to split people into different groups. You know, there, there's some that is not very responsive and there's some that responds very well. But these are the individual one. You can see over here, if you look at full changes uh, from uh, they zero, which is before, <clears throat> uh, on the basic, uh, well, before they initiate the diet, uh, you can see that there's an increase. Uh, some people have a very, you know, it can have like five-fold increase in their circling beta carrying level. And there will be individuals that basically stay flat. The other thing is if you take two individuals with similar uh, beta carrying level at, at zero time, and then take it through uh, the day, uh, the, the weeks. Uh, you can see that there are some people just keep on increasing it, but there's some people just uh, stay the same. So uh, individual differences uh, are, are relatively important. So if you have a diet rich in beta carotene, uh, would this person more benefit from it or this person bit more benefit from it? So those are questions that need to be addressed if we are looking at, you know, food and 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 a health effect or food and uh, some kind of you know protected effect. 
Now, have you seen this slide before? Uh, I kind of say, oh yes, you know, because the vegetable is so good that it can protect it from uh, of all these uh, uh, different diseases. But from a population study, you know, if you do a, uh, ask an epidemiologist, you know, basically, you know, it's either maybe or bad, or, or maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, but there are so many variables in there. And, you know, for example, you know, just what I've said before, the matrix may, may play a role. You also have individual difference, you know, uh, people from different region may have a different uh, type of diet uh, and the diet they eat may be very different. So all these can feed into this kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, confusing uh, data here and there. So um, that's, we, unless we, we kind of, you know, <clears throat> work out all these differences, it's, it will be relatively hard to paint a picture of what is, you know, real, what is not. Um, the other thing is, you know, if we all, th all think that more is, more is good for you, but then there is some uh, compound in the diet is so-called so anti-nutrient. You know, it's supposed to be bad for you. Uh, it depends on who you talk to, too. For example, you know, we worked with phytoestrogen for a long time. It is always thought that all these from our hypothesis is blocking the estrogen metabolism, therefore protective against uh, breast cancer. But then too much may, be, may not be good for you because, you know, there's some concern that, you know, maybe eating soy, soy or food, you know, may have um, uh, estrogen level uh, too high and may have some other uh, property that, that get affected. And phytase is known to, you know, cause a stone. And then from a, a Brascus uh, vegetable perspective, you know, all these Google sunlights they're purported goitrogen. So if you're thinking about, okay, I'm going to develop a food that jack these compound hundredfold, you know, you need, you need to uh, uh, take a pause there and start thinking, you know, what is good for you and why is it good for you? <clears throat> so I, I, this is my uh, so-called conclusion slide. I purposely make this as complicated as possible. Uh, the reason being that, you know, like I first say that for us, it's from uh, farm to poop. But if you, sorry, uh, but if you look at um, all these uh, different processes, there are a lot of things going on. Uh, we're looking at, if you're looking at the efficacy is here. So you have to go through all these to get to this point. So, and of course you have the microbiome, you're gonna muck up everything under the sun. Uh, so, so it's it's a relatively complicated process. We, if we're talking about agriculture, nutrition, or food, nutrition, and then health. Uh, but I think you know the the the, the thing in the red are one that I think, you know, from my own perspective, the kind of question I I I'm really interested. You know, I think it's relatively important. For example, you know. What are you actually eating? You know, like I said before, if you jack a compound up a hundredfold, what are you actually eating? And, and is it really important? Uh, and the other thing is, you know, uh, are, are they really good? Um, is it is it's the more better or healthier or you know? And then what are the biological effects? Because you know if if a compound go in at a hundred, a uh, hundred times more, uh, the effect may be very different than you're only getting it uh, like you know a hundred times less. And then um, the the most critical thing, it would, I think, would be the hardest thing is, is dissect out the individual difference because for such a diverse population, it's it will be hard to to say that oh, okay, this is you know this is good for you, okay, or you know, if we increase beta carotene a hundredfold, that's good for you. Now, some people may not benefit from it. So this is just my humble view of what uh, 21st century nutrition research should be. I mean, it's coming different term, like a personal nutrition, targeted nutrition, position nutrition, or nirvana, if you want to say it. <coughs> um, 
it, it, I think it should be predictive because you know we, we have all these information out there about genetic background and so on and so forth, and it can help us predict something uh, or uptake of a, co a compound or you know what a propensity to get get a, a, a disease and things like that. It should be preventive because we're talking about uh, food that consume every day and the disease development. Uh, wise, I think it's probably more at the, the, the proximal end, you know, either uh, prevent the initiation or progression, <clears throat> not a cure. Um, and I should, it, it, from one and two added up, it should be, per hopefully it will be personal. Obviously this, this is the, uh, what you say, a uh, holy grail, right? Um, it's not gonna happen today, tomorrow, but you know, at least, they, at least we're can come to a point where they, with the new, like AI um, uh, initiative and, and, and we can start moving toward that in a more uh, a logical way. Now, the rise to the Nirvana uh, need a lot of help. You know, uh, I need to point out that Quinn Chi Fan is my support person um, that kind of cover my behind a lot. Uh, Sonny Lowe is the uh, collaborator with Michael Green. <clears throat> uh, Pei and Jing Hao, their analytical cameras help, help us do analysis. Bip Clever, than I already mentioned, uh, she's uh, our former colleague, now retired. Uh, Ming Chen, Steve Bu, we work on the, uh, the rice uh, problem. And then Wally is uh, a longtime collaborator in, in terms of uh, uh, lipid analysis. Uh, Lucy Yu's our collaborator at University of Maryland, and a, a few. Uh, graduate student work on the project, including Jason, Xiaojing, <clears throat> and uh, Zhen Lei. Um, then Zhao Wei Wan from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Chinese University, from uh, Huazong University, actually. Uh, she worked on the RICE project, and then uh, Yan Bei Wu is continu uh, continuing collaboration, uh, doing the microbiome analysis in the Michael Green. And last but not least, I should acknowledge uh, some of the folks from uh, uh, NCI, which help us, uh, <clears throat> uh, which you know, fund us do some of the more interesting, you know, uh, cancer-related project. And Young Kim, John Milner, and some of, if not most of you may know, uh, he passed. But I think you know these uh, uh, seminal in trying to move the uh, uh, so-called uh, cancer and nutrition. Uh, nutrition and cancer prevention area for, uh, so I think I, I, I have very high respect for, for John. Okay, so I should end. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Wang, for your I'm outstanding presentation. Uh, we have some questions. Sure. And I'm gonna read them and then you can, you can take away the go Go for it on the answers. Uh, sure. L, okay, L Mazapina writes, could you please explain why you have chosen red cabbage over white cabbage? Well, <clears throat> it's the color. Uh, it's, it's the, because um, uh, we want to maximize everything and the red cabbage have anthocyanin in there. So, that's the, the 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 reason that we tried to use it. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you probably we probably could do a white cabbage, uh, but that lacked the you know color component in there. Great, thank you. Uh, and another question from the same person: Is there a difference in taste among low, medium, and high resistant starch rice varieties? Do they taste different? I have no idea because uh, <clears throat> I didn't I didn't do the cooking part. <laughs> oh. uh, I I don't think it'll it'll affect that much, but uh, because their their carbohydrate or the starch level will probably pretty similar. Thanks, and and we got a question from our center director uh, Sarah Booth. Mm -hmm. You stated that U.S. consumption and production of cruciferous vegetables were low. Mm -hmm. Do you are you proposing that it's more strategic to scale up with produce such as microgreens? And I, I know those are getting more popular in the stores as opposed to traditional 
cruciferous vegetables, you know, for example, such as broccoli? Um, <clears throat> that's a that's a yes and no question mm -hmm. because you know it 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 actually involves quite a few things. I mean, my, I personally think that that maybe you know promoting microgreen would be a good idea. Well, a couple of reasons uh, behind it. Uh, one is that you can grow it yourself. Uh, it's not like the broccoli, you need to plant them and it take like, you know, uh, 85 days to harvest them. Uh, microgreen, you can basically grow them on, on your windowsill and you can harvest that. Uh, and some people grow it on a wall as a, they call it living wall. Um, and you can basically, you know, okay, I'm gonna eat some salad, I put some microgreen in. So I, I, I would look at that as a, as a uh, advantages uh, because it will not only provide all these wonderful nutrient, uh, classical nutrient, and it's really available and you can do it by yourself. Yeah. Um, the, but, you know, I'm not uh, going against the, the, the uh, so-called agricultural industry because you know the way that you the American agricultural industry is that you know you have a big plot of land and you basically go with a big machine and then you know harvest everything uh, uh, so it's the it, it we're talking about changing the agriculture industry and I, I for one that's not you know qualified to do those kind of things so but certainly, I, I might you know, certainly local growing local sources of microgreens is a sort of a feasible thing it sounds like so yeah uh, if you go to the farmers market actually people sell those kind of thing uh, now you know they'll come in a little a yeah. plastic container and then say here you know and, and it's relatively easy to grow and then you can also uh, grow them in in uh, we're not limited to crucifix vegetable because they can be anything uh, the only thing that you want to stay away from are the nightshades, you know, the potato and whatever, because they have uh, poison in there. So you, you can basically grow anything and then uh, it depends on how, what kind of uh, particular uh, vegetable you like and color you like. You, you can, there's, uh, there's a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Zhandong Wang, who I believe you know, asks, since high consumption of resistant starch, such as amylose, similar to fiber, similar to fiber mm -hmm. can overwhelm the fermenting ability of colonic bacteria, which might result in diarrhea and bloating. Did the animals in your study develop diarrhea with high resistant starch feeding? Do you think our ability to ferment resistant starch can increase over time, making it possible to adapt to a higher resistant starch intake through the gut microbiome, as you suggested. And then this is a long question, sorry. How similar resistant starch percentage in your study to the regular resistant starch percentage in general commercial cooked white rice consumed in the United States? Um, that's a long question. Yeah, <clears throat> the, first one, the first part is about, the, about yeah, I understand. Uh, First I, part I, is about diarrhea in your animals and the high resistant starch. Did you have any diarrhea or? No, uh, but actually the the animals seem to tolerate very well. Mm -hmm. uh, these are these are the highest we get is about eight eight percent uh, right. resistant starch. Now the commercially, my, my understanding is the the normal commercially available rice is more like one percent or so. Okay. So that's the so called medium resistance medium resistant storage. Now sure. the, of course the, uh, <clears throat> the multi-million dollar question is, you know, once you go into the, uh, the gut, what would happen? We know it changes the, uh, the, the, the gut microbiome. Uh, we also uh, seem to think that it, it, it upregulate a bunch of bacteria that, that uh, produce uh, uh, short chain fatty acid and that's gonna change pH and that will have some kind of effect, but so, we, we, all the analysis that we've done with the inflammatory factor and whatever, we didn't see any cha changes. So I think in terms of uh, the actual colon health, it probably okay. Um, you know, we're not doing too much problem. Um, I, we are never gone through the point where we want to challenge it, but I guess, you know, it's, it's what available. There, 8% is about as high as we, we know it's, it's, it's there. But I don't think 
commercially availability uh, wise, uh, they're not, you know, it's not, no. uh, it's not there. But, you don't have to worry about that. But I, but I guess also just this notion of sort of adaptation in the gut to this high starch, you, you think yeah. that happens or, you know, you know, yes, I always say yes, without yeah, okay. any data. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The, okay. Well, the, with some data, I, I sure, this sure. Is, this is this is not not exactly a a you know resistance star study. So let's go back to the microgreen study. So you know we, we collect poop. So you look at the poop, and the first few days it's whatever color, are uh, from you know it's like green, or or purple, uh, probably most likely anthocyanin or whatever. Now, as we go through the day you know, uh, and take it to eight weeks, 12 weeks, uh, it become, uh, the, the, the color disappear. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the bacteria somehow adapt yeah. to it. Now, I, we also know that from, from uh, other people's study that if you take the, the, the food out, the bacteria are gonna revert back to the original. So it could be a up and down, up and down uh, kind of situation you're talking about. So. Uh, the answer is that the long answer to that is yes. I mean, you know, the bacteria will uh, adapt to it. And I think uh, the adaptation, whether it's good or bad, uh, that's a different question. Sure. No, thank you. Very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wayman Guo is asking how would you respond to reviewers' comments that what is or are components in your whole food that is responsible for your observed effects when you? When you submit grant application, so I, I guess he's really asking, you know, how do you dissociate, sort of the, I guess maybe the mechanism when you're when you're trying to evaluate, in your case, like the the cabbage or the microgreens, I guess. Yeah, that's a, that's the biggest problem. Um, therefore, it, you know, we we don't have that in in the microgreen. It's, it's almost impossible to do that because if you change something, something will change. Uh, but from the the, with the rice thing, I think we, we use a low uh, resistance starch, and we use that as a so-called like a matrix control. I think that may be a way to solve it. So there's no perfect, uh, there, 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 there really no perfect con, uh, matrix con control because you're, you're doing food. But I think that low resistance starch rice will be as close as, uh, so-called matrix control. Yeah, I mean, I think that's always going to be a challenge in, yes. in these food studies, but it's it's an important point. And then uh, Larry Parnell from from ARS at the HNRCA asks or says compliments that this is a fascinating comp compilation of research. Thank you. With regard to the red cabbage microgreens, what effect have you observed on developing this as a food? With particular attention to CEA, controlled environment agriculture. Well, um, actually, people are doing that right now. The, you know, I just talked to a uh, some uh, New, New Jersey outfit called Aaron Fawn. Uh, it's actually pretty good uh, for control uh, environment uh, agriculture because it's, it doesn't take a lot of space. And then you can, you, if you do, uh, you know, those either hydroponic or I think now they're doing aeroponic, they seem to be doing very well. Uh, the other thing is that it, the growing process is, is only like seven or 14 days and then you can basically, you know, need to, you know, sell it. So I would say that, you know, something like Michael Green actually would be uh, a little bit easier. And then, you know, if you want to do uh, broccoli, but the big broccoli, Obviously, they also have a lot more fiber than these uh, things. So it, it's a balance between, uh, uh, you know, uh, which, uh, which compound that you like to uh, uh, get into. But from as far as control uh, environment uh, agriculture, I think microgreen will be almost be perfect for this. Kind of thing. I guess in terms of we have one more, one final question. I guess in terms of the microgreens and the red cabbage, just freezing vegetables or fruits affect some of these properties on the, I guess, on the gut microbiome? I'm not sure what the question exactly is, but. 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, that's almost like a post-harvest processing question. Uh, yes, I, I would say yes, but how much, I don't know. Mm. Uh, because you know some some of the compound may be very labile, and you, you you're gonna you're gonna get a decrease in in uh, uh, different compounds. So uh, microgreen, on the other hand, most people eat it fresh, so okay. most most likely it's not gonna uh, affect that much. And then if you're talking about glucosinolate, um, you know anytime you do something, the it'll activate the marathonase and then glucosinolate will be all degraded. So what you eat may not be what you really think you're eating. So it 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 it's there's a lot of process associated with this. So those are the questions that that we will be interested in, in dealing with. Uh, I don't know how much we can do, but you know that's it's important. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Wang. I don't see any questions. Uh, that's going to conclude our seminar for today. I just want to remind everybody that our next scheduled seminar is next Monday, and the speaker will be Dr. Nicholas Musi from the University of Texas San Antonio branch. So hopefully you can join us next Monday for uh, Dr. Musi's seminar. Thanks again, Dr. Wang, and thank, thank you, you very all much for, for the invitation. And uh, uh, send me an email if anybody have question or collaboration or whatever. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Thank have you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks.